Hello, and welcome to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Rich, and as the founder of the Bold Life Movement and a fellow coach for more than seven years, I know the challenges that many of you face when launching or growing your coaching business. And I'm here to pull back the curtain on the coaching industry and help you overcome roadblocks to make the impact you were born to make. Each week, I'll be interviewing successful coaches from every corner of the industry to share exactly how they have managed to generate massive impact and income. From strategy to psychology, we cover it all. This show is presented to you by Transformation Academy, a global marketplace of courses and coaching certifications. So whether you are already part of our Epic community or you're brand new to this show, If you're ready to learn what it takes to turn your passion for service into a profitable business, then keep listening. You are in the right place. Hello, and welcome back to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Rich, and today I have with me the beautiful Hagina Osilva. Hagina is someone that I actually connected with while I was living abroad in Bali, Indonesia. And I remember we lived in a two-story kind of like jungle villa together on a rice field. It was an incredible time. And I remember Hagina was building her coaching business at the time. And she was so consistent about recording content and posting it three times a week and just like hustling and hustling. And then the pandemic hit. And instead of throwing in the towel, I watched her scale her business from $0 to over $600,000 in the past three years. Her life is radically different now, and I've invited her onto today's episode to share with you exactly how she did that. So without further ado, the one and only Hagina. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Profitable Coach Podcast. I am joined today by one of my favorite humans and favorite former roommates, Miss Regina Osilva. How are you doing, dear? I am great. It is so nice to see you, which by the way, Kim, since we lived together, I went through a whole like name rebirth. So I actually go by Hagina now. Hagina. This is very good to know. I should have covered this before we got into the interview. (laughs) Um, And your website needs some updating. (laughs) (laughs) But this is perfect because I feel like right out the gate, we are making two really important points for brand new coaches. One is Mm -hmm. it kind of doesn't even matter what's on your website or if you have one, you can still get clients and make money. I know that when you were first starting out, you didn't even have a website and yet you were getting clients. Is that right? Yep. I called in my first $100,000 without a website, actually. I don't think I even invested in building the website until I was at like 140 in revenue. Thank you. So I'm glad that we're dropping that value bomb right out the gate. And then the second is that whoever you are, when you start your coaching business, whoever you are, when you are one year into your coaching business does not need to be who you are or what you identify as or how you operate two years in, three years in. And so I think it's really important to illustrate how much you've evolved since we lived together in Bali and since you launched your coaching business and you know what that journey has been like. So do you want to take it back a little bit for people who are brand new to Hagina? Am I saying it right? Yes. You're actually crushing it. Most people are like, what? Thank it you. takes them a moment. You got it right out of the gate. It's the <laughs> Portuguese version of your name, correct? She's got it. Yes. And hey. Uh Uh-huh. And it came through in an ayahuasca journey where I was like, all right, I've been wanting to go buy this name forever. So I'm sure we'll like dive into that. But yeah, to fill people in. Hello. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. So my name is Hagina O. Silva. I'm a spiritual business mentor, a medicine woman, a psychic, a medium. And I have started my business. I've had this business for now three years officially. And I really work with new paradigm leaders, healers, facilitators on helping them call in their next level leadership, wealth, and impact. So it's really mirroring and bringing together the concept of business, having a profitable business, which I know you cover a lot about, Kim, and then bringing that into the bigger concept, the bigger picture, what we're really here to do as light workers, as as leaders during this crazy time, as we are heralding a new era, a collective awakening, a massive shift. So yeah, Mm. that's what's been going on. And it's been a wild journey since we (laughs) lived together in Bali because 
that was really the beginning of all of this. And you and I, like, we've been kind of like following each other, but we haven't had a chance to really dive in. So it's fun that we get to kind of revisit the story today. It's one of my favorite things about having a podcast, always has been, always will be, is the reason to invite people to a chat, whether it's someone that I personally adore and look up to and am impressed by, or it's someone that I've never met. And I'm like, I really want to talk to that person. I want to pick their brain. Uh, so anyone listening who feels the call to have a podcast, I encourage you to do it. Even if you have 500 listeners a month, 50 listeners a month, the opportunity to get on the horn with someone that can add massive value to not just those 50 to 500 or whoever, however many people, but to your own life, it's, it's really impactful. So Regina, take us back to 2019. You're recording consistent content. I remember we lived in this two story. What was it like a, a bungalow? It was a jungle bungalow, a hundred percent. It was amazing. I'll post pictures actually in the show notes as well for people who are like, I want to know what this looks like. Uh, Take us back to the beginning of it all for you. And what have been some like big milestones on your journey? Yeah. So at the beginning, when you and I were living together, I had already proclaimed that I was doing this whole entrepreneurship spiel, this path. And it really felt to me like I was honoring a calling which I'm sure many of you will relate to, even you, Kim, right? It's like this deep knowing. I always knew I wasn't going to get a regular job, corporate, nine to five. I never even did that. And so I was life coaching at that time in 2019 because I had just gone on a massive spiritual awakening. And I really wanted to just pass on the wisdom of how I went from this anxious, depressed, living in a tiny LA apartment to traveling the world, going to places like Bali, doing things that I would have never even thought about doing five years prior, taking these massive risks. But at the same time, even though it was in alignment and I was following this passion, I was at that time throwing spaghetti on the wall. (laughs) I (laughs) give major props to myself though, because even though I didn't really know what I was doing, I was showing up. I know you remember there would be like hours and hours I'd be sitting there, I'd be making calls, really connecting with people in the DMs, talking to people that I knew from college, from my hometown, just with service, like showing up. Mm-hmm. How can I be of value of you and for you? And using that as like the icebreaker to see if they wanted to work together. But it was a yeah. lot of like just shooting in the dark. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I'm sure you relate to this at the beginning. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so what was one of the the things that actually like started to tip the needle for you? In terms of how I started to finally call in clients and sales and yeah. all of that? Yeah. In terms of turning it from a hobby of service <laughs> into a profitable business, a very profitable business, in fact. Yes. We've been thriving. I've been very blessed. Okay. I feel like there's a couple of things coming through as you ask this. One, it was finally surrendering to the fact that I didn't need to do it alone mm. and investing in myself in big ways. And so something that really kickstarted this process was when I finally made the largest investment of my life into my first business coach. And this was a really big deal because I didn't have like any money. I was broke. <laughs> I had just graduated college not that long before. And it was a big risk on me betting on myself. And it was such a catalyst for the belief that I had in my mission, in my work. It really allowed me to connect to the knowing that the success that I wanted, the life that I wanted, the business that I wanted was inevitable. And was I willing Mm -hmm. to take action to reflect that knowing? And so I I did it, even though I was so scared. And I know for a lot of beginner entrepreneurs, because I work with a lot of beginners as well, That's like the hardest part of the journey is the big first investment. And it was $5,000 I didn't even have. I had to borrow half of it, like beg to borrow half of it. But I was just so trusting and knowing that God, the universe had my back. Like I wouldn't have been called in this direction if it wasn't for a reason. So that was like one of the big things. 
And then through that, getting clear on what actually moves the needle. Because mm. yeah, I was wasting countless hours on my like trying to make my website, which we already talked about, doing all of these things that didn't actually matter. And so I started focusing on relationships, on content, and on sales conversations mixed with finally owning my value and, and getting out of mm. imposter syndrome and actually creating a high ticket offer that would provide powerful results and like, boom, it just kickstarted everything. And yeah, it, it, one offer, it was that one offer during this time, which I'm still to this day offering, it's obviously evolved, called the Unstoppable Creator Blueprint that has been responsible for like 80% of my $600,000 aligned revenue. Like, is that not mm. crazy? Signature offer, the power of a signature offer. Yes. One offer. 80%. What were some of the key things that you remember doing to move through the imposter syndrome? Because like we said, it's inevitable. So inevitable. For me, it was really coming home to the integrity piece, like meeting the part of me that had imposter syndrome because there was a desire to be in integrity. Right. Like a lot of us actually have it because we're like, oh, I don't want to teach something I don't know. And like I want to be able to provide results. But mm. if you are teaching from experience, it is embodied knowledge, then it's truth. Yeah. And so really creating that mindset shift around that was massive. And then also looking at my realistic timeline. I think a lot of people get stuck in imposter syndrome because they think that they need to have it all figured out when really, especially in this mentorship coaching space, you are teaching people the, the part of your timeline that you've already lived, right? You're helping them collapse mm. time, get there easier, faster with less mistakes based on what you've gone through. You don't need to have the five steps ahead nailed down, just what they need in order to go through that journey. Yeah, totally. And I, it goes back to this concept of three experts that I learned from Brendan Bouchard and I teach whenever people will listen, which is like, Yes, teach from a place of expertise that you've developed by getting those results for yourself. Or that's version number one. Or version number two is you're an expert because you've helped other people get results in this area. Like maybe you've helped people lose a hundred pounds before, but you yourself have never lost a hundred pounds because you've never had a hundred pounds to lose. You can still help someone do that, and you've shown that with a proven track record. And then number three is you've studied extensively people who have found ways to lose a hundred pounds. So even if you haven't yet gotten a client and helped them do that, you know, the tips, tricks, and proven strategies to make that happen. So that's version number three. And I think if we can recognize that we all are probably at least one of these experts, then it helps to move through that imposter syndrome sooner. Yeah. I wish I would have known what you just shared at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time and energy because the mindset work at the beginning is the heaviest it will be. Not that it's not still here because it never goes away. The mindset, the energetics of business, right? Even mm -hmm. now I have an over half million dollar business. I'm still moving through it. But because at the beginning, it's like the most unlearning that you're having to do, the most reprogramming. It's the it's the most discomfort you're going to feel because you've never done it before. <laughs> like, wouldn't yeah. you agree? It's like at the beginning, mindset, energetics, so important. Yeah. And so what has made you a better coach over the past three years? It's mm, a good question. I knew you were going to come and bring me some delicious <laughs> questions to marinate with. I love it. In classic Kimberly fashion. <laughs> what has helped me become a better coach? Well, there are some resources that come to mind that have helped me in terms of like tactical skills. So one of them is a book called Coactive Coaching. And I actually read that mm. in 2019. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's pretty like- I have it. I'm going to make a note. Oh, no. oh, it's great. No, it has, we'll like, have it in the show notes. Yeah. All of these tips and tricks just on how to be a better facilitator. And then there's another book called Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Ronberg. Have you heard of that one? Oh, yeah. You're, you're oh, yeah. 
So I haven't used it as much with clients, but personal life, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I found for like leadership moments as you're scaling and building a team, it's been really helpful. But yeah, Mm. those resources have been helpful. And then also just practicing, right? Like it's, it's a skill that you evolve. And I, I think, you know, when you have the natural ability, like whether you have it or not, my whole life before I even decided to become a coach, people were always coming to me for advice, support. And I'm sure if you're listening and you are a coach, you resonate with this. So there's that natural talent that you have. And then the willingness to really be self-aware and be an investigator. Like, okay, with my client, why were they able to get such powerful results? You can even ask, like I ask my clients, like, what is it about my coaching that helps you? And and just mm-hmm. using this awareness to fine tune my methodology. Um, and then of course, like just learning from other mentors and workshops, yeah, has been all an all encompassing journey and helping me facilitate, be a better listener and help people come to their answers on their own. Right. Cause that's what our job really is as a coach, as a mentor, is not spoon feeding, is really helping people navigate their own internal wisdom that we all have. Yeah. I think that you you hit it on the head. I was hoping that you would say practice. (laughs) We're leading a coaching program right now. It's brand new for the community called the Coaching Confidence Accelerator. And it's Mm -hmm. one of the main core like premises of this particular program is that they get a lot of practice. And I think that the difference that you can feel in your body between session number one and session number 20 is so such a radical shift that until you've done it, you can't, you can't know it. You can't embody it. Right. And so um, the other really important thing that you said is other coaches, other mentors, like putting yourself in the position of both client and researcher and taking notes, like you want to be able to do the exact thing that they are or be confident enough to tweak it and make it your own. So I think that's really integral. Yeah. I find with the different mentors and coaches that I've hired or worked with, there's something that they help open in terms of, you know, I'm a little bit more esoteric, but like, channeling wise. So, so sometimes they can unlock or mirror something in me that I'm like, Oh, and then it, it, it allows that to activate within me. It's like a certain way of doing things, a certain like channel that they're accessing just by being in their space. And I'm like, Oh, thank you. You actually just unlock that for me. And now I actually have acquired this skill just through like exposure. Yeah, no, that super resonates. I remember one of my first coaches leading us through an exercise where we wrote on a piece of paper, like three um, expanders that we had, three people that we looked up to, uh, didn't even necessarily have to be in the coaching industry. And then we wrote down the traits about them that we appreciated. And at the end, we crossed their names up from the top and we realized, oh, I actually have all of these traits within me. They're just not fully expressed. Like that person has a more fully expressed version of that trait. And so that's what I hear you saying is like those mentors, those coaches just sort of like got you in the frequency of that trait that was already longing to be expressed and existed within you. Yes, exactly. It's that the mirror ability. Yeah, you just worded yeah. it so beautifully. Love it. You've <laughs> always been really good at that, Kimberly. <laughs> You're so sweet. Uh, one thing that you have been really good at, and and you mentioned earlier, is embodying the position of leader and bringing on the team so that you are not doing it all on your own anymore. You know, sitting there recording hours and hours, editing hours and hours. Who was your first hire and then Mm. why? Yes. So I actually hired pretty fast because I knew that in order to scale, I needed to free up my time and energy. Like that is my most precious resource. And so once I had my first launch, it was a $15,000 launch and I was so burnt out because I was working, I don't know, probably 60 hours a week at that point. It was insane. I was like, Mm. all right, I'm hiring out. And it was a virtual assistant. Her name is Courtney. Like this woman, she ended up staying with me for two, almost two and a half years. So talk about loyalty. Yeah, we met in person and she just helped me with so much on the back end on, you know, the things that were taking away from my zone of genius, the biggest needle movers, which I've already mentioned was creating connection, having sales conversations and creating content. 
So yeah. she was definitely a huge catalyst for the continual expansion, for the scaling to, yeah, continue on the upward momentum. Wow. And then who was your second? My second hire. Well, then we brought in, I'm trying to think order because there was a time, I'm pretty sure it was my website designer after Courtney. And then I brought on another VA. So it was my website designer. Finally got my website <laughs> nailed down because I didn't by the way. until that point. Yeah. Yeah. Hired someone to do it for me. And then I hired another VA and then Courtney actually got promoted to copywriter. She became my copywriter and then the new VA became the VA. I love it. I love it. And so I asked these pretty like 3D tactical questions because I think that for people whose minds are more linear, this is where they get stuck. And this is where um, the overwhelm can sink in because they're like, yeah, but how? And then what? And then what? And so there's this element on this show of wanting to empower people to really put on their entrepreneur hat and recognize like a lot of this, you, you just sort of figure out as you go. And if I can shortcut that for you, like I'm going to, I'm going to ask the very practical questions. Um, you have also been able to consistently create a lot of content on more than one platform for a long time. Talk to me, pull the curtain back a little bit. Talk to me about the realities of growing a social media presence and how you would continue doing it and how you might do it differently if you were starting over. Mm -hmm. I will pull back the curtain because it's definitely one of the most important facets of my business. And one of the biggest reasons I've been able to create all of this is because of the visibility, yeah. which came from my content. And specifically in my story, I don't know if you remember this, Kimberly, but like TikTok was a huge reason that a bunch of my launches at the beginning were selling out and it's what allowed the social media presence to grow. So there's a couple of elements coming up with this. One, it's the energetics behind creating content, right? So knowing mm. that content is this energy exchange, people can feel us. They know when we're embodied. They know when you are bullshitting or speaking from truth. They can feel you in your personality. And so having, again, to come back to this theme of getting over all the mindset stuff that was keeping me from expressing myself, because there was a time where I would like upload something and then delete it. Like, oh, I look fat or like, oh, this sounded mm. stupid, right? Like all the shadow bits really getting over that, doing the shadow work while simultaneously taking action and just showing up, knowing that content was only going to get easier if I just kept putting myself out there. And then it looked like making space for creativity, like knowing mm. that if I'm going to be, again, exuding this energy through a screen, I have to prioritize blank space, time in nature, hanging out with people that like nourish my mind and my soul that could bring me ideas so that I could bring these innovative takes into the social media space and really start to pique people's attention because I'm not just saying what everyone else is saying. And then the third bit that's coming through is a little bit more strategical. It's, it's about creating more of a structure. So I, from the beginning, created this content process. To this day, I still use this where like one day is saved for brainstorming, preparing, mapping out. Like I know who my ideal client is. I know the different types of content to create, to build, to know, like, and trust. And then another day I would batch film and I batch it and I'm doing it all at the same time, making sure before I film, I'm in a high energy state. I'm feeling good. I, I, I'm exuding what I want to come across in my content. And if I were to do anything differently, hmm, well, I'll say all of that still applies to this day. Like if the basis of things, even if my marketing strategy has slightly changed, I still follow that process. I think it would also be just making sure not to get burnt out. Like if I were to do anything differently, because content is such a heavy part of this, there was a time where I got super burnt out just because I would push and force. So I think this kind of brings up the topic of when is discipline helpful versus hurtful mm -hmm. and really honoring your needs. Because there were some times where I'm like, you know, exhausted, 
But yes, I told myself I'd batch content today. I would do it anyway, but then my energy was off, right? So if I could go back, I think it was just prioritizing that balance a little bit more. But luckily I've already moved through that hump. But if anyone else is going through that, don't get yeah. burnout. because Content creation burnout is a thing. Yeah, totally. And I see it from pretty, or I have seen it from pretty much every player in this industry who has really made a name for themselves, um, especially like the, the corner of the bubble that we find ourselves in, uh, female coaches, business coaches, et cetera. And I think that that's one of the really important things that I want to do on the show is say like, hey, yes, a lot of these people have experienced burnout. Maybe that attributed to their success and there is another way and they've managed to figure out that other way. There was a, a hump that they got over, right? It's not the only way. So appreciate your your candidness. I think it's really helpful. Yeah, of course. I have to be real about the burnout because it is so real in any industry, but I see yeah. that a lot. It's like you get people who they just reach a point and then they have to completely like there's no consistency because you're either like full on or you're burnt out and then you have to take the the pedal off. So like, how can we find that happy medium? Yeah. I think it's also like a, a trait of the sort of savage entrepreneur that is drawn to this business in the first place, right? Like we're kind of extreme individuals on, off, adventure, impact, leadership, like it kind of takes a certain personality type to want to do this long term, right? And so uh, it doesn't surprise me that balance is maybe something that we all need to learn at some point. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> and so I'm curious, this has come up a lot in my circles lately. How have you managed to stay authentic to you, surrounded by so many people doing really similar things? Mm, and not, and not get distracted. distracted. Yeah, there's no surprise. This is coming up for you because this has been coming up in my circles as well. Because yeah. I think it can be really easy to lose your voice, especially when you are working with other mentors, coaches, you're just seeing what everyone else is doing. And I've definitely, it's happened to me where I realize I'm like, is this actually me or am I just copying what I saw or what I heard or what I think I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do? And so what has helped me come back into my expression, my voice is really keeping the blinders on. One, becoming less of a consumer and more of a creator. So really checking in how I'm using social media with intention. So mm -hmm. no longer... I mean, it still happens sometimes because I'm human, but like trying not to get caught in the doom scroll and the like yeah. in the, the consumption of social media. And how can I use this platform as me being this creator, pushing it out? Not saying because obviously we're having conversations and focus on relationships, yeah. um, but really being mindful of that usage. And then really when I'm creating content, checking in with myself, checking in is this grounded? Is this actually embodied? Really like doing a, a a double glance over what I'm writing, the videos I'm filming, and just being super cognizant of it without being like obviously a perfectionist and, and getting too caught up in it. But yeah, making sure I'm speaking from an embodied place, creating from mm. my body, not from the mind. Mm. And what does that look like for you? Creating from the body. Yeah. So with that content process I was sharing, I have a little ritual where I will first like meditate before I create and have ideas and, and creativity sessions. I will set an intention. You know, I want to make sure whatever flows through me in my channel is for the highest good of those who will receive it. And really using my skills as a channel or as a psychic medium to then use it as a channeling session. And to me, I actually see the content creation process as something that I'm co-creating with spirit, with source. It's, mm. it's not really something I'm doing on my own. It's something that I'm tapping into for, for the highest good of whoever's going to receive it. Yeah, totally. I shared on our coaching office hours calls today about the 100 Days to High Vibe program. It's something I ran two years ago under the Bold Life Movement umbrella. And 
a hundred days of content just flowed through me one day during a journaling session. And I was like, well, that was clearly not mine. Mm -hmm. It's I, I was praying. I was like, I just want to serve. This is like middle of the pandemic. I didn't know what I was doing with my business at the time. And, and I was like, I just want to serve. How, tell me how to do it. Show me. And it all flowed through me. And I was like, whoa, I like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> it's a whole different way of looking at what ideas are, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's just a whole like overview of what actually is our creativity, but we won't go down that rabbit hole because it's like a whole another. It's a great book on it called Big Magic. Yeah. <laughs> go read it. Um, you, you said one thing that I want to kind of go back to because it marries really well with a question that I had. You talked about being a psychic medium now. And I know that when you first started your business, that wasn't really something that you were identifying as. And so my question is, how do you constantly evolve how you're identifying yourself publicly or, or, or what the messages are that you're delivering? without letting the fear of what other people are going to say or think stop you? Mm. This immediately has me think of, yeah, the natural evolution and expansion of my brand has coincided with being brave and courageous and telling the stories that feel really edgy to me. So when mm. I came out as a psychic medium, it was about a year and a half after we had lived together. Like I had always known I was a psychic medium. And there was a part of me that felt really scared to come out with it, of course, because yeah, I was scared what people were going to think, but there is no other remedy except courage. <laughs> so I knew mm. that once I did the thing and I was courageous enough and just came out with it, like, like that was it. Now it's like the, pro the proclamation, this is who I am now. Same thing when I came out with my, my new name, right? Like this is who I am now. And then as soon as you muster up the courage and you take the action, you realize on the other side, no, oh, this wasn't that bad. <laughs> like your mind created this whole story. Yeah. But through that, I now opened up a portal of connection for my audience to now know me deeper, which means they can know themselves deeper because that's what they see in themselves. And so mm. every I like zoom out and look at my business journey, every big expansion has priest like what has come before it is this is a big courageous move on a, a story on a message on on some part of me that I hadn't shared yet so I'm glad you asked this because it really has been a theme throughout this whole business yeah and I would say even claiming yourself as a coach could be the big thing that someone is too scared to do and as someone who had that very fear, I can tell you the other side is actually really exciting. <laughs> a lot oh of people God. want to support you when you come out with like a new goal or dream. They really do. This You just reminded me of my first coming out video. I was so scared. Like when I announced I was a coach, it was so freaking scary. But j just like the story, the process that I told you, it's like once it happened, like that's it. And as you said, so many people were happy for me. It's like the mind creates this crazy story until we do the yeah. thing and we see the reality. We just like shine a light on the shadow. And some of my first clients for my launch that I sold out was actually from friends. It was from people in my like closer circle. They were just cheering me on. It's like I created this whole story because the ego just wanted to keep me safe, right? Because yep. me becoming a coach was a new path, but once you overcome it, you understand like this is exactly what needed to be done. Yeah. How is your life different now than when you first launched your coaching business? Oh, it's so different. Well, first, I've spent the majority of 2023 going back and forth between Florida and the Amazon rainforest because do I first, yeah, do you tell? I'm like, so basically, I, even though I was life coaching in 2019, I really say 2020 was like the birth of my business because that's when I finally yeah. did that whole story I shared, big investment and in all of that. But in 2021 is when we introduced this new identity of medicine woman. Um, when we were in Bali, actually, Kimberly, I had a vision of me in 2019 in a sound healing of me in the Amazon rainforest. And I was like, what is this? I think I'm Chills. being called there. I know. And then, of course, 
In a series of wild events, a friend was supposed to go on this trip to the Amazon rainforest, couldn't go anymore, asked if I wanted to go and like work with ayahuasca and meet the Yawanawa indigenous tribe. I'm like, I think this is the vision that I had. (laughs) So that's what began the whole era of the last two years. Long story short, started working with ayahuasca, fell in love with an indigenous man there. We started dating. We're still dating to this day. I got really close to the family there, and now I help them co-host retreats and expeditions to the Amazon rainforest where we do like plant medicine, cultural immersions, and it just added a whole new layer of my mission. That's when I actually, in an ayahuasca journey, received like the inspiration to go by my new name. I got business Mm -hmm. ideas. I started, actually, I received the message for my message now in my business, which is all about new earth in a ceremony (laughs) through my work there. Yeah, girl, it like it's been a minute since we've dropped in, but I know you've been seeing what's been unfolding. I have have a taste. Yeah, yeah, a little taste. (laughs) And so one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show is because I love that your path has been so different. Like, yes, there's obviously overlap with the female spiritual business coach like that is not a new flavor but the re- the hygiene they say it right yes, you flavor it. is one of a kind and so i think it's really cool to show the audience that like you don't just have to be working from your laptop in a hotel on a beach like you are literally making it work in the freaking amazon how <laughs> did you how did you do that like how did you take something that seemed um on paper to conflict with the paradigm of online business coach and make it work? That's a really good question. Cause I remember a couple years ago, even seeing someone said this, some leader expert was like, Oh, if you want to have a successful business, like you better be grounded and rooted. And I'm like, no, I've been nomadic for five years and now I'm visiting the Amazon. Honestly, and terms of how I've made it work, it's just been about like trusting my intuition, trusting the call and knowing that the more that you trust, the solutions present themselves. Like it's no coincidence that over the last two years, then like, for instance, in terms of, okay, how do you get internet? Elon Musk dropped his new satellite, right? Starlink. And now I have I have internet that is just as fast as what I'm doing now here in Florida in the Amazon rainforest. I'm like, And so it it was about being just present with the journey because especially with my relationship is complex. We did long distance for a while, right? Like just being present, knowing that if you're present and you're trusting intuition Mm -hmm. and you're letting soul guide the way that everything is going to work itself out. Because imagine if when I first started getting invited to go there, I was like, yeah, but there is an internet and like this, I can't go. Like it would have been a complete, a complete block of what was trying to unfold, what was trying to expand Mm. instead of just trying to go with the flow and and trusting. It's like the mind would have gotten involved and potentially tripped me up. And then who knows where I'd be today. Yeah. I love that. The key takeaway that I'm hearing is when you, and this gets, this goes back to being really good at listening. When you hear the call, don't question it, just trust. Mm-hmm. Be be like, okay, I'm the instrument. I'm the vehicle. I'll do it. Whatever you say, spirit, and then just trust that it's going to work out. Mm, I got goosebumps. And, and that has been the theme for this entire spiritual business journey. It really has. Because sometimes you're going to get a call. It's not going to make any sense. You're like, yeah, but I don't have this. And blah, 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 blah. like, nope, just trust, just surrender. It will take you to far greater places than you could even imagine. Yeah. So you said something about being grounded and I want to follow that vein for a second. How have you managed to like, and I'm going to get a little esoteric, a little woo woo with this question. How have you managed to keep a really healthy root chakra and continuously feel provided for and grounded even when you are living nomadically? It's a good question because people ask me that, right? It's like, this year wasn't that bad, but there have been years like last year where I was in like five different countries in one year. Mm-hmm. Me, what has kept me grounded in my root, which is so important, is my spiritual practice, my morning practice. It's the the time that I've set every single day, no matter where I am, devoted to meditating, 
to like sticking my feet in the actual earth to gratitude. I have a session where I just go in and I share what I'm grateful for, whether it's out loud, whether it's in my journal. And has there been like 365 days of the year where I do this every single day? Like, have there been years where I do that all the time? Absolutely not. Again, human. Yeah. There have been times where I've gotten off the routine, but yeah, it really comes back to that devotion. And I try to say devotion now instead of discipline because I feel like discipline can have sometimes like such a hard edge on it. But when it's something a little bit more connected to your spirit, it's like, oh, it's devotion. It's a practice. Anything that is going to keep us aligned, it's going to keep us true to who we are and what we're here to do. It's it's about really having that love, that devotion for self enough to upkeep the practice. So yeah, that's what's yeah. kept sane. <laughs> I love that. I think that rituals can be incredibly powerful and thinking of our life as like a living prayer, a prayer of gratitude, a prayer of um, calling something in and just trusting, just turning it over you know, mm -hmm. a prayer of like listening for what's trying to come through. But like you said, when we first started the interview, that comes only when we create the space. So if we're always in do, 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 create, 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 and then even consume, consume, it doesn't allow for like the, the higher voices to like come through. Yeah. So I really Absolutely. like that. What about the moments where things have not gone as you would have hoped? The failed launches, <laughs> the crickets, you know, we've all had them at some point or another, I imagine. How, what did that look like and how did you move beyond it? Mm -hmm. This is so inevitable in your business. <laughs> Everything <laughs> ebbs and flows, ups and downs. It's inevitable. I tell everyone that I'm like, if you're expecting it to be yes. all rainbows and sunshines, you've signed up for the wrong career. <laughs> yes. Like, Folks, let me tell you, there have been plenty of failed launches, crickets. It, like you said, it happens to all of us. Everyone. What has helped me and what I always share with my clients is the emotional mastery part to this, to entrepreneurship. So it's actually, it's based on a spiritual definition if you really look at it, but it's you becoming the observer of what's going on instead of identifying to the story, right? Like instead of, you having this launch and it failed and like making it mean something like, should I quit? And like, blah, blah. it's like, how can we just recognize those feelings, honor them? Yes, we're not going to bypass them or ignore them, but zoom out and really look at the long term game, right? If, if we yeah. zoom out and look at this being a decades long career, which for me, it definitely is like I'm in this for life. One launch, one failed launch is just a little blip in the timeline, right? So Am I going to recognize it as just being a blip or am I going to give it way more weight and focus and attention that it doesn't need to have, right? So really like yeah. stepping outside of the box, knowing, okay, it's not the end of the world, being the investigator, what did I learn from this, right? Really looking at any failure, quote unquote, as an opportunity to learn. I don't think failure actually exists. I think everything that happens in your business serves for your evolution. And yeah. it's always after the fact when I can zoom out and look at that failed launch where I'm like, ah, I get why I failed it, quote unquote, right? Like, ah, I needed to really like heal this part of me. And, and, ooh, my energy was a little off here. And strategically, I wasn't really showing up. Like my content wasn't consistent. And then I can hmm. refine and know how to continue moving forward. So for anyone listening, I hope this has given you an opportunity to really reframe your perspective around failure. Yeah. I even had, I'm taking this, this notion of one launch being a blip in, in a much larger business and uh, zooming out even more. I had this realization a few months ago. I was like kind of kicking myself for repeating a pattern, what felt like the millionth time. And, and I was like, when am I going to learn? Like, I'm aware of the pattern. I've been aware of the pattern. When will I actually transmute it? And then I, I realized like, okay, my spiritual beliefs are that this is not my only life on this planet. It's one of thousands. Um, they're probably all happening right now in other <laughs> timelines. You know what I mean? Like that's my, it's my own personal belief system. And I was like, in the grand scheme of my eternal existence and all the <laughs> incarnations that I'm making on earth, if by the time I like completed all of my incarnations, the goal was to have healed that, that pattern or whatever, 
then I think I still got a lot of time. <laughs> and like, if I improve it even just a little bit in this lifetime, then that feels like progress versus mm-hmm. having to heal like all of the wounds in the shadow in this one incarnation. Um, and it, anyway, it made me feel better. <laughs> I like it. It's it's always when we take that zoomed out perspective, right? Like you could even yes. take it when you have like a bad day and then you zoom out and you're like, guys, we're just like floating on a rock in, in an infinitely expansive universe. You're like, oh, it really yeah. brings things into perspective. Yeah. And that's why nature helps. Looking at stars, mm-hmm. looking at mountains and realizing how uh, how everything means so little. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's only the meaning that we assign to it. So let's like pick exactly. awesome meaning, right? Helpful meaning. Um, before we wrap up, I would love to know, what do you wish you knew when you started? Hmm, this is such a good question. Okay. Hmm. This might be cliche, but I really do feel like I wish I knew this sooner. Just do it. <laughs> like, just do it. Stop like getting in the mind, thinking it, overcomplicating it. Just take the action. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So that may be your answer to my next question. If you could leave all of our listeners with one piece of encouragement or wisdom, what would it be? And it's okay. Mm. If it's <laughs> no, I think there's something different coming through. Hmm. <laughs> I would say the answers are there once you quiet the mind. And I really mm. invite you, all of you, to listen to the heart. Like, really, mm. the heart goes. Listen to the feelings. Let that guide you. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I would even add to that. If the heart wants it, don't question it. Mm -hmm. Don't let the mind come in and tell you why it wouldn't work or why you aren't smart enough, old enough, young enough, pretty enough, whatever enough. If the heart wants it, trust it and just take Mm -hmm. action over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Yay. (laughs) Gina, where can people follow you? Where can they get more of you? Yes, more of me. So you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. It's all under Hegina O Silva, spelled R E G I N A O S I L V A. And then I also have a podcast if you want to check that out. It's actually on pause right now, but we're going to bring it back it's called The New Earth The Way. And then, of course, mm-hmm. don't be shy. Like, say hi if you listen to this on Instagram. Like, DM me. I love hearing from the podcast world and and other new human beings. I love it. Well, it's been so nice and so overdue getting to catch up. I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. And I hope we get to play in real life soon. Same. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Chica. Wow. Big thank you to Hegina Osilva. Always a pleasure to reconnect. If you like today's episode, do me a favor, leave us a rating, leave us a review on your podcast app of choice. And if you want to get more information about some of the resources that we chatted about today, then be sure to head over to theprofitablecoach.com slash 014 for episode 14. There you'll get access to Hajina and all the ways that you can follow her and connect with her. And if you're looking for even more support in growing your coaching business, then I invite you to check out our free resource at theprofitablecoach.com slash freebie. This tool will help you magnetize the clients that are perfect for you, and it'll clear up any of the ambiguity around how to actually call in clients as a brand new coach. So if you want that resource, again, it's at theprofitablecoach.com slash freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to connecting with you guys. As always, feel free to DM me and connect on Instagram at the Kimberly Rich, and I will catch you on next week's episode.